it's always harder than you think to start up and grow a company. Mm -hmm. um, younger entrepreneurs especially, they, they don't know what they don't know and they think it's easy because they read a headline that you know, someone raised $100 million in venture capital. And behind every instant success, there's usually five to 10 years of preparation, whether it's preparation of those people and that team or working on the business, trying to figure it out. Jim Collins says this as well in the Good to Great book that, you know, when he went in and studied all these hundreds of companies, it was eight years before they really had their formula figured out and down. Welcome to another episode of the People Hum interview series. I'm your host, Vanessa Rose, and let's begin with a quick introduction of People Hum. People Hum is an end-to-end, -end, one view integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Hum blog and the video channel, which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest, Bob Norton is the founder and president of Airtight Management. He's a speaker and an author of the Startup Manual and co-author with Warren Bennis, the father of leadership. He is also the creator of the CEO Bootcamp and other advanced management and leadership training programs for CEOs, entrepreneurs, C and senior executives. We are extremely happy and honored to have him on our interview series today. Welcome, Bob. We are thrilled to have you. Thank you. Happy to be here. It's our pleasure. So, Bob, you're the founder and CEO of Imagine Land 2, which is a very interesting concept. So, could you share a little bit about it and how did you, you know, come up with this an idea? Um, well, um, Imagine Land is the world's first uh, on-demand child care facility that will focus on social and emotional development of children, which has risen to sort of a crisis level recently. And it was co-founded by myself and another person who started as a client. And we've been working on the intellectual property for three to four years now on a part-time basis and are, are getting to uh, getting ready to launch it in the future. Um, I've actually been the founder of six different companies over my 30-year career and grown two startups to over 100 million in sales. And Imagine Land is exciting because it will have a very positive social impact. And I do a lot of volunteer and philanthropic work around helping children and um, that makes it extra exciting and, uh, and a big opportunity to solve multiple problems. Um, the changing workforce is a problem that it helps because gig workers um, really can't get on-demand daycare. You know, they, they have to sign up for two or three or five days a week at most daycares and a lot of gig workers, you know, need it occasionally or one or two days a week or, or they don't know when they're needed. Like if they're a real estate broker and want to go out and show a home, um, you know, they don't know when they're going to need it. So they need an on-demand capability. So, um, yeah, we'll be launching that uh, later this year. We have a crowdfunding campaign and a commitment from an investment banker. And we'll be opening the first three locations in Austin, Texas. And, and we plan to open 120 locations over five years as we roll it out into other markets. Congratulations for that. Yes, thank you. So what would your advice be to new entrepreneurs, you know, who have been forced to think twice now because of this pandemic? Um, well, I mean, that's a big question. It's kind of like, how do you solve world hunger? But, you know, there are some very common uh, issues that a lot of new entrepreneurs do. I mean, they almost always underestimate the time and the money needed to accomplish uh, bigger goals. Mm -hmm. And what hurts them is what they don't know they don't know. So everyone needs to think through, you know, their strategy, their execution, the planning of the management team, um, you know, having some mentors or a coach on the team. Uh, and, and really have what I find, you know, being, a, I'm also a participant or a coach in the Gathering of Angels, which is a, a regular meeting of angels that invest in small companies that's funded hundreds of companies over the years. 
And probably 80% of the companies that come to that aren't really yet well prepared. They don't understand how they have to dovetail a financing strategy over three or four years with milestones of what they can achieve in proving the risks in the business and 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 that their product works and the demand is there and that they selected the right market and and so there's a few books i recommend any entrepreneur must read you know one is good to great by jim collins another is the lean startup um and i also recommend the book blink by malcolm gladwell one of my favorite authors uh, and, and you have to be prepared as a new entrepreneur to be on a rapid learning curve. You should be consuming, as I did when I was an early CEO back in the 90s, you know, four to six books a month, because no matter what you did in your career previously, as you step into the CEO and entrepreneurship role, suddenly you're responsible for everything across all the disciplines, sales, marketing, finance, operations, product development, human resources, you know, capital raising, and on and on with management and, and legal issues and all kinds of things. So you've got to be prepared to be 100% committed and be on a constant learning curve. And you got to make sure you have t team members, whether they're employees or consultants or just friends you have lunch with, that can give you advice in all those key areas that I just named where you might not have, you know, kind of full-time working experience. Um, it takes five or 10 years to become a quality CEO. And I know, cause I've trained a thousand of them in 30 countries now between my CEO boot camp and my one-on-one -on -one coaching and my airtight management program. And you know, the CEO job is the hardest job there is because you really need to know 50% of what all the other department heads know to, you know, to be a sounding board for them, to determine strategy and to, to manage and motivate uh, people. And of course, as Jim Collins says in the book, Good to Great, to get the right people on the bus and in the right seats is his, his metaphor or analogy, you know, for getting your team right. Yeah, so you're saying it's a combination of both theory and practical put together. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you've got to have a good strategy that is going to create a differentiated company that has some barriers to end around it. You do that, you know, and have discipline around execution. Um, you know, you'll probably become successful. If you do both of those things really well, you'll have very significant market share and in some markets even dominate your market, um, you know, because most people don't do these things well. You know, typically when I go into a company, I find they're not using 80% of sort of the standard best practices of management science. Mm -hmm. One of those being goal setting, which we're talking about a little bit today. So speaking about technology, what, is, what do you think is the extent of technology being involved in the success of well, an organization? Yeah. Yeah, I think every organization needs to have a technology plan. And most people look at it in a very narrow way as, you know, what you're doing in your IT department or internally. Of course, it's different for a company that is, you know, their, their product is technology. They have to be state of the art in every way and better than anything else out there. But I always believe, and, and I'm a past vice president of engineering and, and chief technical officer. Uh, I worked at Thomson Reuters in that capacity and ran big development teams in software and IT and MIS and mm -hmm. built global real-time fault-tolerant communications networks for Wall Street. And you know, it's very important to ask the question, how can technology be used in every area of the business, not just IT or, or the service internally? You know, whether it's marketing, distribution, technology is touching and impacting everything. And you create sustainable competitive advantage by being innovative and a little ahead of the curve. It doesn't mean you have to be on the bleeding edge and be the first person doing everything, but you don't want to be the laggard in the industry either, or your competitors will eat your lunch and you'll go the way of the dinosaur because technology can 
reduce costs and increase speed of delivery, uh, and also open entirely new markets by adding functionality and capabilities that, that are not available from your competitors. Things like artificial intelligence and rapid delivery. You know, if you think of Amazon and their success, you know, it's all about variety of product and speed of delivery and, and of course, good prices, right? And, and, and Jeff Bezos is famous for saying, you know, I know for sure 20 years from now, people are always going to want it faster, cheaper, and more selection, right? So he can continue to invest in those things with technology to improve them and know for sure that he's going to get a return on that investment. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, all good technology plans, that should be true for. You should always be able to calculate and expect a good return on investment from any technology investment you make. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't do all things at once, but, you know, you rotate through improving technology in each area of the business quarter by quarter or year by year, depending on your scale. Yeah, I think it's not something that organizations can have. It's something they need to have now. Absolutely. No question. You, you, you will be disrupted by someone else if you don't keep up with technology. I mean, and the perfect example of that is, you know, Uber and Lyft. They basically, you know, ate half of the taxi cabs, you know, business in a, in a couple or few short years as well as expanded the size of that industry greatly because the convenience and the price went down as the result of good use of technology. Yeah. That's a very good example. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, every business leader, you know, is focused on fostering a productive work environment. Unfortunately, many are not able to do that. So what reason do you think is that you know is stopping them and how do you develop a long-term strategy to achieve these goals yeah well i think that goes back to kind of the foundational business uh practices or best practices of management science mm -hmm. as i said when i go into a company to consult and do work organizational development work and planning and strategy I find, you know, 80 or 90 percent of companies aren't using well over half of the well-known best practices. An example of that is goal-setting programs. <clears throat> um, the two most common acronyms for goal-setting programs are OKR, which stands for Objective and Key Results, and Google and Intel and others have made that famous. But essentially, it's just a rebranding of Peter Drucker um, and what he invented in the 1960s called management by objective. And the research shows after 50 years of, of doing this, independent research shows that the companies that do goal setting well have 56% more value creation. And by that, I mean enterprise value or equity value of the company because of better profits, better growth, better revenues than companies that don't have the discipline they should have around goal setting. So that's number one. Um, number two is a, a, a defined process for coming up with a good strategic plan. Um, you've got to have annual and quarterly updates to the strategic planning process because, you know, the markets change lots faster than they used to because of technology and, and product life cycles are shorter. So you've got to have a discipline around um, strategy and implementing and broadcasting that to your entire team. Um, you've got to have, so that's number two. Number three would be good discipline and process around hiring and training staff. Um, I have what I think is a very good video on YouTube. And if you search on airtight management and uh, Southwest Airlines, there's, there's a bit of a case study or an example of how their strategy is enabled by their, their brand and their hiring. Uh, and, and it's very worthwhile because you have to have um, a synergy between who you're hiring and your customer base and your strategy. And oftentimes there's a disconnect there for companies. So the discipline around hiring and training is, is kind of number three on my list. 
Um, I think that where a lot of companies fail too is creating an environment that is challenging for employees and where they feel appreciated. Um, contrary to popular belief, money is not the number one thing that people look for. It's actually number three and feeling appreciated and feeling challenged, which gives the employee growth and allows them to grow in their career and their salary are more important to the best people because they're thinking long term uh, and, and you know, as their experience goes up and their abilities go up, obviously their their value in the marketplace and their salary and earnings will grow up go up too. So don't focus on money and salary being the main thing to attract employees. Make sure you create an environment where people can grow and feel appreciated. I always have a quarterly sit down with all employees to have a development plan in place for each employee each quarter. What are they gonna learn? What books are they gonna read? Are they gonna go to a seminar? What new skills are they going to try? Especially if you're in a growth company, you need to be growing your employees internally you know, and, and have continuity of those employees moving up where they can with the organization, not bringing in all fresh blood because, you know, those, you want those people to stay with you five or 10 years, you know, not be replaced by others when the company doubles in size and, and they haven't grown themselves to handle the bigger company. Um, you know, and, and I'd add one more thing that's sort of related, sort of, you know, a 4A, four, four and that is to attract and keep the best people, you want to share in financial success. And, and in the United States, we have stock options to do that so that employees feel that their extra hours and effort um, you know, will be paid for in the long term with success. It's not just about the salary, but there's a, a golden handcuff, as we call it here, um, to keep people with the business a long term by participating in the long long term equity play that the company's growth is going to generate. And so that's very important to keep turnover down and to, you know, again, motivate people to grow with the company. Right. Yeah, we're far from money being the ultimate goal anymore. It's more of belonging over, you know, money now. Yeah, and one other thing is, you know, our, our younger generation especially has been brought up to think about how they'll impact the world. Mm -hmm. And people don't, you know, they want to get out of bed in the morning knowing they're helping someone, right? Whether it's a customer or an individual or the world as a whole, um, Simon Sinek's very famous uh, video that has tens of millions of view called The Why is all about that. And I recommend everyone watch that video mm -hmm. because it, it's really why people stay glued to your organization and are excited because they feel and see the impact they're having on the world mm -hmm. or at a minimum your customer set in making, uh, making them uh, more successful. Right, especially the Gen Z now, they're so opinionated and, you know, they love challenges. Yep, yep. And, and people, the best people want challenges. You know, you don't want to be a squirrel, you know, just gathering nuts all day and doing the same thing, um, you know, especially in the management team and the supervisors. All of those people should have growth goals and be given new challenges each year. Right. Since you've spoken so much about setting goals, what extent do you think is a performance and strategy influenced by goal setting? Um, well, I mean, goal setting is how you communicate and synergize the team to be thinking. I always think of it as, you know, if you had a lot of people in a rowboat and they're all rowing in, their, in different directions, the rowboat wouldn't be going very smoothly, right? So you've got to invest the time in meetings and communications to make sure everyone understands the goals for the month, the quarter, and the year. And obviously, depending on their seniority, they're going to have a longer planning horizon and, and doing the things that need to be done to execute those larger goals. So, 
the strategy, as I said, should happen, a, you know, a major, I usually do a two day off site annually with a management team, um, you know, and that will happen over sort of a six week period with everyone having homework. Uh, and, and that way with everyone in the team working on the strategy, they really understand it and you're getting the input from every area of the business. And then you know, no strategy is written in stone. You know, it will evolve, it will change. And so it should, you know, there should be a half day meeting to update that once a quarter or so, again, with the team and no distractions, best done off site. Um, all of these management best practices that I teach in airtight management mm -hmm. take about 5.4% of a manager's time. And the ROI on this is huge because just that one MBO thing I mentioned is 56% improvement in value creation. And all those other things you do, you know, are actually more. So do, having the discipline to do these best practices is really what separates the, the also ran companies from the hugely successful companies that grow rapidly. I can often go into a company that's been growing at 5 or 10% for 10 years and get their growth to 30% in three to six months, mm -hmm. simply by synergizing the team and implementing these simple best practices that you know, are, unfortunately aren't taught well in schools and require a lot of experience. I, I put you know, Harvard MBAs through my CEO bootcamp and they always turn their head sideways and say, Bob, why didn't they teach me this when I paid $150,000 for my MBA? And the only answer I ever have is because they don't know it. You know, this is practical experience. It's not information that's easy to put in a textbook. And uh, that book I, I recommended by Malcolm Gladwell Blink talks about those four levels of learning and how people have to go through those levels um, to become experts in anything over about five years. Yeah, it's a lot of investment, but I think that it's completely worth it at the end of it. Yeah, well, the, these investments have a very high payback and often very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for instance, another best practice is implementing a dashboard with key performance indicators or metrics for each person or at least department in the business. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the, you know, other than goal setting, that's one of the highest bang for the buck things that most companies don't do well. Uh, and when they do it, they often let the software people, you know, bring in a software product and they've got all the infrastructure to measure it in the software, but they're measuring all the wrong things because they don't have an expert figure out what are the KPIs that map into the strategy and its achievements successfully. Um, so that's a business problem, not a technology problem that you delegate to software people or even to accountants um, because it's a strategy challenge and your KPIs have to connect your strategy and your execution well so that everyone is looking at weekly, monthly and quarterly numbers mm -hmm. and they really understand the expectations of them and can be accountable. And, and of course, some of those numbers will be integrated into the monthly goals that are you know, numbers alone, as opposed to finishing projects or, or more subjective things. Yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, a lot of organizations are closing down now. So do you think this is a lesson to be learned here? Um, <clears throat> well, COVID-19, is something that you know is what's called a black swan event it's something that happens once every 50 years potentially and I don't think you can fault people for not being prepared for it because most companies can't be thinking you know about the you know the one percent case or you know what happens every 40 or 50 years um, a lot of businesses will go out of business because they didn't have enough cash buffer. And it's always better to raise money and, and have some cash in the bank when you don't need it mm -hmm. and not wait till the last minute. So some companies will fail because of that. You know, others will fail because they fail to pivot their strategy. Um, you know, we knew another pandemic was coming. Bill Gates gave a speech on it that you can see at 
uh, at the TED, uh, the Technology Education and Design, TED.com site that has tens of millions of views. And he gave that speech back in 10, uh, 2015, saying that, hey, the next problem we're going to have that has the potential of killing millions of people is, you know, is a pandemic. And the coronavirus was even mentioned specifically because there had been, been others, um, you know, with that form. And this one's just 14 times more communicable or contagious. Um, so yeah, I've heard that, you know, maybe 20% of restaurants will go out of business and never open. Of course, in time, those spaces will be, uh, you know, they'll, they'll declare bankruptcy and shut down, but those spaces will probably be re-rented to, to new businesses. You know, the United States in particular is, is a very resistant and innovative co country. And so, I think we'll recover, but it's not going to be fast and it's not going to be painless. There's going to be lots of problems, but I don't think you can fault the companies for the weather. You know, there's always external out of control situations, whether it's the regulatory government environment or war, you know, or economic recessions and, and black swan events like this and, and what happened in 9-11 that had a huge impact for many, many years, some would argue 10 to 10 years plus on the capital markets and what happens there. So you got to be ready to pivot and change your strategy. You got to, you know, as a rule of thumb, you know, even a startup should make sure it's got six months of runway, enough cash in the bank to go for six months and continue to manage in sort of a bootstrapping mode, even after it gets a chunk of capital in the bank because you never know what's going to happen. And you're, you know, as the company gets bigger, your planning horizon has to get longer too. And that's a mistake a lot of little companies make. They don't stretch out their planning horizon. And, and as they get bigger, it takes a lot longer to implement new things. And, and so you can't continue to act like a, you know, a, a small company when you're a medium company. You have to shift gears and act a little differently. And, and that's one of my specialties is preparing companies to scale, you know, and, and a checklist of 100 things that you need to think about doing differently. Mm -hmm. Because as human beings, we all burn into our head our past success. And, and that can be a trap, you know, a success trap, because we think because we did it this way before, it should be done that way in the future. And that's never the case when you have a rapidly company that's getting bigger and bigger. You need to adjust your management style and all kinds of things, you know, as you go from a raw startup to early revenue to a growth phase and ultimately a mature company, I use a five stage level of planning or model and, and you, you really need to act differently in each of those five stages. And a lot of books are kind of written for the mass market and they want to sell it to the big companies and the little companies and the medium sized companies. And so, you know, they can be watered down in terms of their advice because the advice to a startup you know, in the same situation can be exactly the opposite as it would be to the advice to a medium size or larger companies. You just have to act differently and have different philosophies and protocols and procedures and time frames and risk uh, tolerance uh, for things, and as well as sense of urgency. You know, the smaller the company is, the more agile it needs to be and, and, and have a high sense of urgency to get things done quickly. That's the only advantage small companies have over big companies. So if they don't take advantage of that, they're probably in trouble. Yeah, that makes so much sense. So no matter if you're small or big, you have to be far-sighted because you don't know what might hit us when. Yeah, everyone needs a five-year plan and where they're going. You know, the famous one from Bill Gates was, you know, the, the founding principle of Microsoft as a vision was a PC on everyone's desk. Mm -hmm. And it took 20 years to sort of get there, but the vision was right. And it was a filter to drive the business through. And, you know, it seems obvious to everyone now, but it wasn't obvious to most people. I wrote the PC growth in the eighties and nineties 
and, and grew many companies by using PC technology to replace mainframe technology, mm -hmm. giving my companies a huge competitive advantage over the big dinosaur players that were invested in, you know, big computer rooms with huge staffs and halon fire systems and raised floors. We literally dropped the PC into Italy and, and it fed all our customers at Thompson Research one PC because we owned it at a customer site. Mm -hmm. And our competitors had an infrastructure that would have required a half million to a million dollars a year in infrastructure to do what we were doing with that one PC. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a perfect example of how technology, you know, can really rewrite the rules. I mean, we grew so fast, so fast Thompson bought Reuters and Reuters yeah. was a billion dollar company when we were a startup. Yeah. So we were so successful, we caught up with them and had so many new and innovative businesses that our cash flow allowed us to grow, mm -hmm. to, you know, to, to, to buy a huge competitor when we started. Yeah, that's a very impressive example. So, Bob, do you have any last sound bites you'd like to leave our audience with? Um, yeah, I thought about three points when I got these questions a little earlier. And, and one is, it's always harder than you think to start up and grow a company. Mm -hmm. um, younger entrepreneurs especially, they, they don't know what they don't know, and they think it's easy because they read a headline that, you know, someone raised $100 million in venture capital. And behind every instant success, there's usually five to 10 years of preparation, whether it's preparation of those people and that team or working on the business, trying to figure it out. Jim Collins says this as well in the Good to Great book that, you know, when he went in and studied all these hundreds of companies, it was eight years before they really had their formula figured out and down. Now, I don't think it should take that long. That's a historical average and it can be done a lot quicker, but it's a bigger mountain than most people think. You know, until you've climbed it, you don't know how long it's gonna take. Like research and development, there's a lot of unknowns. So think about it as a bigger challenge and a marathon, not a sprint, when you're starting a new company anyway. Um, a second point is entrepreneurs and newer CEOs with less than five years in that job really need to have a mentor or a coach. Mm -hmm. They really need to have a board of advisors with specialty skills that they can call upon because no one can know everything. I mean, the last Renaissance man was in the 1700s, mm -hmm. right? Or Renaissance woman to be particularly, you know, to be politically correct today, right? The person that could know everything there is to know. Well, that just doesn't exist anymore, right? So you need to build a team and, and that can be virtual and advisors and you know people you have lunch with, but you gotta think about building that team. I have a, 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 a product or a, um, a tool called the skill set matrix that helps figure out and plan teams so that you can fill in the holes in your team because what you don't know and don't have on the team can kill a business. Um, and my last point, which is a little self-serving is I think every, uh, CEO needs to be very proactive about their learning as they're going into that role. And I believe my CEO bootcamp is one of the best tools available because it's got um, the, the combination of my engineering mindset with 30 years of experience as a CEO kind of systematized to give CEOs and entrepreneurs a roadmap to design a company, launch that company, and then grow that company in the early days. And so you, you, you've got to put your ego aside and you've got to acknowledge what you don't know you don't know. Sometimes I spend half of my time with CEOs coaching them, trying to get them to step out of their ego, thinking they know everything, to acknowledge the risks so that they can address those risks better. Um, entrepreneurs are often what you know I call pathological optimists, right? They think they know everything and that, you know, the weather is always going to be great. Well, guess what? The weather is not always great. And you've got to look at this marathon, which might have weather problems along the way. And you've got to be constantly preparing and getting better and growing yourself. What, what psychologists call self-actualization, right? 
reaching out and finding ways to improve yourself as a leader, a manager, a CEO, or a vice president of whatever you do if you're on a senior management team. Um, so, you know, reach out and, and learn and read and go to seminars proactively. We never have the time and we always prioritize these things less and they have a pretty rapid return if you're picking the right events and the right learning experiences. So, so that's my third point. And, and I think if people did all three of those, you know, the, the failure rate of startups would probably go from 80% to well under 50%. Mm -hmm. Those were three power packed points, Bob. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate you sharing your time and your insights with us. I had a great time. Great, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to maybe doing another one later on another topic. Yeah, that would be great. Great.